OK, so I gave a talk uh, not so long ago, earlier, and I ended off with one of my songs that uh, I wrote using mathematical principles that I gleaned from the Beatles uh, song, songs that they wrote. Um, and so I'm going to play the video for, this, for the song that I played at the end of my talk, again, in case you weren't here. And then I'll talk about some of the individual things that I picked up and I either used or I stretched the principles. Okay, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how I wrote the song, some of the aspects to it. I've never actually talked about this. So I've thought about it. You know, for a long time I had my mathematics and my music separate. Um, once I started working on mathematics in music with the um, opening chord of A Hard Day's Night, I began to look over my process of songwriting, which I continue to do and I've done over the last 45 years and to think explicitly about putting some mathematics in it. And uh, I think very few people do that. They may do it naturally, but they don't think about it explicitly. So I'm going to tell you about some of the choices that I made. So patterns ag three against four that I talked about in my talk um, that Chuck Berry did and George Harrison loved. Uh, in this, the patterns of threes, for instance, I do on the opening. I do four patterns of threes, and uh, I think it gives a sort of a wildness to the opening. That was the intention. Hiding beat one, I'll be talking about. Unusual chords, not based on fifths and thirds. Assumptions about the middle eight. 
extensions to, to sections and acceleration. So let me talk about each one individually. Here is what I've just played for you a little bit. The uh, little riff I played. So that's three eighth notes and I repeat it. So I repeat, if you have patterns of threes and basically in rock music it's patterns of fours, you need to do the LCM, which I did. Four patterns of threes equals three patterns of fours for them. So I intentionally did that, put that in there, because I thought it would th sound exciting. Um, hiding beat one, which I mentioned in the opening uh, chords of I want to hold your hand. So rather than start it like this, which would have started on beat one, which would have been fine, what I do is I hide beat one by stripping away the first three. So one and two and three and four and one and two. Mm -hmm. So I have a feeling kind of, th it's a little joke, where is beat one? You only know when, when the music comes in. Unusual chords. The, I took the chord that I found out for A Hard Day's Night, which is an unusual chord that George Harrison plays, and I wrote a chord based on it. It's based on fifths, A to D to G to C, which is unusual. And I put that chord in the middle of the song, intentionally. Um, Assumptions about the middle eight. The Beatles had a habit of writing what's often called a bridge section. It's a middle section in a piece of music. But the middle section is often called a middle eight. Does anyone know why the middle section is called by rock musicians primarily a middle eight? Eight, eight bars. But most of the time it's eight bars, but often in the Beatles music, sometimes it was seven, sometimes it was nine. They still call it a middle eight. Okay, so uh, it's just the, the, the way they thought of it. Um, but one of the assumptions I realize about a middle eight is typically the verses are 12 bars long or 16 bars long. The middle eight is always shorter. And I thought about, well, what about making a bridge section, a middle eight, that was lo as long or even longer than, uh, than the verse chorus? So I intentionally did that. I think it works in the song, and it doesn't feel overly long. And yet it was, so that's the idea of taking a mathematical principle that I found, or assumption that's in the Beatles uh, canon of music, and twisting it to see you know, what, what would happen if you broke those rules. So I have a bridge length of 17 bars, and sometimes it's 18 bars. And it's at least the length of the verse chorus, verse refrain. And then there's an extension to the section. When I have the bridge, I come back to the bridge, and I then thought about it. Well, it's 17 bars long. Second time I come through, the Beatles had a principle. Never repeat everything, anything exactly the same way twice. So I decided to add in an extra bar there where the singer sings in falsetto. And accelerating by doubling, I put little dots there. If you listen at the end when I played, when we sang the op the ending chord, it is a, really a hard day's night chord, it's unusual, but you can see where people sing, different people sing their last ooh at the end, uh, it accelerates. And exactly, I, I plotted it out for people to sing based on cutting the time intervals in half. So, let me talk a little bit about some more musical ideas. I don't know if you've heard of the term prosody. Prosody is the term that means when the lyrics of the song and the music match each other. So, um, it's often kind of hard to figure out, you know, when, how to make that happen. But when it happens, um, things seem to reinforce one another. So let me give you some examples in my own writing. Uh, so, uh, let me, I thought I would have that here. Just see. Oh, I think what's happening is it's not playing. Let me go back. Uh, okay. Oh. This is a song I wrote called Something's Missing. Something's Missing. Yeah. 
here. So I'm not going to play the whole song there. What I decided, if you listen to it, usually songs in, in popular music, they're in 4-4 four, four time, 4 beats every bar from beginning to end. Sometimes they'll be in waltz time, which is 3-4. What I decided to do was to keep it in 4-4 four, four time, but I occasionally dropped a beat. And you probably didn't notice, but I have a bars of 4-4, four, four, bars of 3-4, in the little riff, it drops a beat, and then I even have a bar of 2-4. So the song is about something being missing in a relationship, and the music is made to match that with prosody by having beats fall out. Okay, now, um, you could try to use the 3 against 4 that I mentioned before, but I use that in a blues song to alter the length. Remember in the last talk I mentioned blues are typically 12 bars long. Well, you can extend it, and I used, uh, I used three against four to extend it to 16 bars long, but it's actually 16 and a half bars long. And the half bar should bother you if you notice it. But I think by using the threes against fours, it's, it's kind of seamless. So let me play a little bit. You've got me where you want me. Right here down on my knees You got me where you want me Oh baby, please don't tease You got me where you want me you One, two, three, me, one, two, me, three, you one, two, me, three, you one, two, three, three. Where you want me So I think you can get the feel there. It goes by without noticing, but I get to make some unusual mathematical choices there. Okay, so what about lyrics at the metal level? I don't know if you've heard of, I hope you've heard of, someone named Randy Newman. Now he's famous now because he writes all the Disney movies. But he has a dark underside to him. That he, when he came out in the folk um, and pop era in the late 60s, he wrote these subversive songs. Um, he, he wrote one, um, you, Mama Told Me Not To Come, which is about going to a party where there are uh, various things being drunk and smoked at the party, and his mama told him not to come. He's, and it's a very funny song. Listen to it. Um, there's another song, You Can Keep Your Hat On, which I won't go into details. It's a hilarious song. He wrote a lot of good songs back then, but he wrote unusually in what's called uh, the voice of the untrustworthy narrator. Usually there is an assumption, like we have assumptions in all kind of mathematics, uh, of, um, uh, of trusting the narrator. Whatever the narrator says, you believe. And you, you sympathize with the narrator. And he has a bunch of songs where you can't possibly uh, do that. So I'm going to give you a little song. So I had a friend at my songwriter circle. I write probably a song a week and I've been doing this for, for a couple of years now, but I've written songs since I was uh, 14. So I had a songwriting friend who came to me and said, um, she has this ex-boyfriend, and every time she writes a song, he says, is the song about me? Is the song about me? And she says, no, it's not about you. Well, I decided I would write a song called This Song's Not About You, Karen, about that premise. So let me play a little bit. This song's not about you, Karen. It's not about you. We were once boyfriend, girlfriend, but those days are through. This song's not about you, Karen. It's not about you. It just so happens the song's about a dog named Karen, too. So I played this and I get a couple of reactions. Now, the rest of the song is explaining, talks about the dog, but of course you understand that I'm really talking about Karen in the song. And uh, so I've had two kinds of. Uh, um, I have two kind of responses when I play this song live. Um, I have uh, young people who will be bent over laughing and getting the, the joke that older people tend to stare me down, think I'm the meanest bastard in the world with this girl Karen. There's no Karen in it. I just thought it's a funny, but it's done at the meta level. You don't commiserate with me. You have to see at some level, I'm not telling you the truth. So um, sequences of musical events can be viewed as walks in an associated graph. Let me show you what can happen if you do it for chords. 
When I talked, I talked a little bit a while ago about a ha, um, I want to hold your hand, the bridge, in my talk, about looking at the chords for the chorus and the bridge. I'm going to draw a picture. This is how I think of chord progressions. I think of them as directed graphs, where the vertices are the chords, and the arrows are one chord being, going to the next chord. And so I think about this. There's a way of viewing uh, what happens with the modulation in the song and the fact that it should have been a G F chord instead of a D minor 7. You can look at it. There is, in red is the bridge. Uh, in black is the, the chorus for the song. Really, there's, there should be a note identification. And really, it turns out to be the same pattern. And I think of this in my music writing. So I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit. So let me show you some examples. I've actually used this to automate the process of helping me to write songs, to chords for songs and riffs for songs. So let me play you a little bit. I can choose the start and end point. So that's part of my algorithm. Choose the start and end point for different little chord progressions. And then I use generate them rather randomly, conditional probabilities, for the chords in between. So I've chosen the two minor chord in two places, then the six chord, and then the four chord, and then the ten chord. Left the rest blank, and I had the computer tell me what chords to play. So let me, uh, and this is what it came up with. Hopefully it'll play. So all the red chords, I'm on the one chord in the top line, are being generated by the computer. So that's based just on what John Lennon his chord progressions used. So I had to generate something new based on uh, uh, his tr uh, transitions between chords. Then there's one for Lennon McCartney. I think I'll skip ahead because I'm getting close to the end. Let, let me sh explain. You can do this not only with chords, but you can view it the same way with melody notes and even riffs in a guitar uh, uh, sequence. So a riff is a little segment on the guitar that you typically use translations for which are called transpositions in music, to build blueses and parts of songs. So let me give you an example. This is a riff that was generated by the computer that was based on the riffs that John Lennon wrote. So have a listen. It's completely new. There is no John Lennon song that uses this riff, but it's based on the transitions that he uses. So I'm getting, that's Lenin, I'm based on Lennon. Then I did the same thing based on McCartney. So it's a different guitar riff, but based on his style. Let me just end off with one where you can combine the two. And unlike anything else, I can have combined the minds of Lennon and McCartney truly, take all the riffs that they wrote collectively and have a new riff based on them. takes me to the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Jason, when you were having the song Something is Missing, I, that just cued in my mind um, the book written by uh, Georges Perec, uh, La Disparation which has no letter E. What would be the equivalent in music of a novel written with no letter E? I mean, you can omit a note, and sometimes people will do that. More commonly, someone will try to intentionally use all the chromatic notes. So Billy Joel, uh, I think it was Billy Joel, uh, or Paul Simon, I can't remember, 
um, maybe it's Paul Simon, I think in the bridge to still crazy after all those years, he intentionally wanted to use every note. That's a very mathematical thing to do, not necessarily a musical thing, and he spent time to work in every chromatic note. So there are, you know, that might be, I, I, you could certainly omit a note, and people omit n many notes. So I'm not sure what the, um, whether that would be recognizable, but you could do it as an exercise. But including everything is a much harder, uh, harder thing to do. You're welcome. Right, I don't think chat GPT, but there are other AI models that will generate out songs, and I think songs in certain styles. The, the, uh, the only thing that, you know, that, that bothers me about that is that you will only get more of the same. Uh, you know, one of the things I think that attracted me to the Beatles is I listen to songs like I Want to Hold Your Hand and She Loves You. I can't think of another song at that time that's anything like them. You know, if you were going to write a song at the time, if you had ChatGPT to write the song, you would write a rock song based on the blues, like Yakety Yak or Long Tall Sally or one of those. That, those are the kind of songs that were being written, everything with the same chord progression. So I don't know, you know, how you will get something truly new uh, from that. You will get things, I think, that sound g good, but, you know, are they, you know, but if you want to move the needle forward, I think that's, that's a different question, and I don't know that whether AI will ever catch up to that, but thank you.